Oh my goodness. Okay, great. Well, I guess that's that. Well, hello, people. I guess we're going to start this. Oh my god. I thought we'd never done that. All right, so we're going to start oh doing goodness. a wonderful video okay, again. Great. Well, I guess that's that. Well, hello, people. I guess we're going to start. Why am I hearing my voice? Oh my god. I thought we'd never done that. All right, so okay. we're going to start oh doing a wonderful video again. Well, I don't know which one I'm doing here. I guess that's that. Well, hello, people. I guess we're going to start. Why am I hearing my voice? Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. I thought we'd never do that. Well, right, hopefully so. Okay. Okay. Oh, my God. Well, I don't know which one I'm doing here. I guess that's that. Well, hello, people. Oh, hi, Kelly. Can you see us? You know, this phone, I'm trying to set up. Oh, my God. I'm not going into uh, the phone. Well, that's not good. I don't know which one I'm doing here. I'm going to be quick because my phone seems to not be working tonight and I might have to reschedule this because I'm not sure what's going on with the phone. Anyhow, we were tentatively going to be doing a setup for spring, a quail introduction. Live 101. Oh, God. That's Kelly. She's yeah, dropping yeah. in. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah, we're supposed to be doing a live video about setting up for spring, getting ready for spring, and putting the quail things together and learning, you know, what is the priority about doing that. I apologize about this vertical video. This is a pain in. Ugh. Every time I set it up, it redoes this. But I guess we'll just do a vertical video. Hi, I'm Chris. I'm Angela. And welcome back. And enjoy this tall form video today and point it down a little so we're going to squish together a little more yeah so the point of this week's video we wanted to do a uh <laughs> oh hey hey there oh, wayne wade wade oh hey wade. hey hi hi guys yeah sorry thanks thanks for being a patient this uh, thing was screwing with me in the beginning so this week we really wanted to talk about getting ready for spring that's kind of unusual it's early for that isn't it um, Not really. Yeah, time flies. <laughs> so it's yeah, it's holiday season right now, and if you guys are over the age of five, you realize that like, what do you call it? Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's kind of just poof, they go yeah. by in a blur, and before you know it, it's you know the springtime planning session starts in late December to mid January because you know you really want to start getting things set up before it's a rush. And in this little bit of time, you know, the kids are gonna be out of school and right around, I think, December 27th, you'll be going insane because the kids will be home for a few days and you're gonna be, uh, what do I do? So anyway, enough of that blabbering. Getting ready for your springtime food production with? Jumbo quail. With the jumbo <laughs> quail, yeah. So Dinosaurama, if you guys have not seen this before, we focus on jumbo quail because they're extremely efficient egg producers, meat producers, and uh, they do not require the oversight and management of chickens. So mm -hmm. basically everybody can keep them and have a food program. And in today's wonderful uh, uh, food distribution economic climate and the ch things have changed, a lot of people moved, to their, moved out of the cities or they got small farmettes or homesteads. Mm -hmm. And we're looking to raise our own food. And quail are fantastic to do that. And they're very simple, very easy to learn, and pretty hard to screw up. Although, you know, you will have a learning curve with anything. Okay. Did mm -hmm. I blab enough? Do you no, want to say something? Fine. No. No, you're doing good. I wanted to quit because of this vertical phone stuff. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. new people. Whoops. I'm tripping over <laughs> here. New people. What are quail? So, and a lot of you guys who watch this, you keep quail, and, you know, it's like a community, and everybody kind of, like, sees what everybody else is up to, how you do it, like a social thing. But this is for the new people, too, who are wondering about quail. What is a quail? So, quail is a small game bird. There's many different varieties. We focus on and encourage, again, our niche is the food production mm -hmm. capacity of these birds. So, we focus on and encourage the Caternix quail or the uh, 
the jumbos. Jumbo quail. They call them a million different names. Browns. Cortornix. Yeah, Japonica the, is the, the Latin name. Maker. But they are the larger variety of quail. They get about the size of a, what do you say, a grapefruit? Like a grapefruit. You always say about the size of a grapefruit, mm -hmm. which is bigger than an orange. And they produce about 300 eggs per hen per year. So they are very prolific egg producers. Mm -hmm. Show you some eggs. Here we go. So here's some quail eggs. Right. I show three because three is about the equivalent of one regular big old chicken egg. So they're very proficient egg layers. Mm -hmm. And another huge benefit with your quail and what, why the planting is necessary is their rapid growth. They grow very, very quickly. Okay, From the day they hatch to the day they start laying eggs is only a month and a half. Six weeks. Mm -hmm. They'll begin laying eggs. By eight weeks, they're laying consistently. By six, you know, six they start, and eight they're consistent. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This yep. is correct. I would agree. <laughs> correct. <laughs> and the, the jumbos, uh, they lay the, the largest variety, the largest size of the eggs for quail. Um, they, some of the smaller varieties might lay more eggs, but the jumbos lay quite, quite a lot of eggs. Um, it's... It's around 300 or more eggs uh, per year for a hen, and they lay the, the larger ones. Yeah, there's tons of good info. I mean, we've done a million of these classes on the benefits of quail over chicken. In the description down below on this video, there's a bunch of links. They're educational links that we made here for you guys. Like, they're written to be very simple so that even the kids can understand and learn this stuff. Mm -hmm. But this is probably the best thing I think we have is this little checklist because if, if you're totally new, and we send this out to everybody, it's because a lot of people are new, but it, this checklist will show you like the um, 25 most, is it 25 or is it yeah, 20? It's 25 most common questions, and questions like the things like how many quail can I have, how big do they get, where do they lay, how many males do I need, et cetera, et cetera. For raising them. Yep. So down in the, um, what do you call it, comments, there's a bunch of links, you guys, it's all free stuff. But it's something you can just put on your phone or whatever and refer to or give out to somebody else if they're interested in getting these little critters no matter where you live. As long as you speak English and can read English or translate it on the internet, I guess you can do that too. Okay, so planning for quail. Why is this important and why, why did I want to do this now? All right. I have this issue called I like to procrastinate and a lot of people do that. So... Oh, thank you very much for what you do. Oh, man, okay. hey, thanks. Yeah. You're very welcome. You know, our huge goal here is to assist other humans into enjoying their short time here on the planet Earth by uh, endeavoring a new activity and not being scared to do that. You know, a lot of the things um, we want to try, people kind of pull back on because it's a little bit of fear mm -hmm. and anxiety associated with it. So take this away. Don't be afraid. I mean, the worst that can happen is... You quail die and you got to start over. And that usually never happens, right? So don't be afraid and just try. They're very easy creatures. Mm -hmm. Anyway, back to the whole labyrinth. Why do we plan now? Like, what is the important issue about planning? Oh, I didn't, we didn't talk about this video. No, we came no. She likes to have a little talk before we do <laughs> these things. So planning. Big issue we always talk about is goal. Yeah, you want to set your goals. Goals heading. And make sure um, to set the steps to reaching your goal um, so that they're achievable. You wanna make sure they're realistic um, steps. So if you're planning for a future uh, change or um, you know something you wanna accomplish, then obviously you're gonna to wanna to be able to do, um, prepare yourself in a way that's manageable and makes sense and isn't you know really stressful. So pre-planning to get set up for your quail um, before you get them <laughs> is ideal. Yeah, so going in like with anything, yeah, like she's saying, know your goals, know what you want. If you're doing, <clears throat> if you're totally new, and we get this a lot, somebody's totally new and you're like, I just want one quail. <laughs> you know, like, I want one quail and like, I just want to see how that works out. And that's fine. I mean, I understand. But, you know, with more education, people are like, oh, it's not really wise to have just one quail because they're um, covey animals. You know, they, they live in groups. They're group creatures, and, you know, so you want to educate yourself, learn about what you're getting into. So, again, it's not going to be scary. And then you can set your appropriate goals. And you're doing this now, again, in uh, early winter. 
because the winter flies by mm -hmm. and you want to have all of this stuff kind of planned out for yourself in the spring. So, because you got a million other things coming up. Oh, I got to do my cleaning, get the garden ready, mm -hmm. uh, get new clothes or whatever it is for the kids and all these other obligations. The last thing you want to do is like, oh God, I got to build a hutch. How do I do that? So we're planning in the, in the late, in the early winter to get this stuff set up so you're not overwhelmed. And with these things, these quails, they're very simple. So yeah. not a ton of work involved. Just proper planning prohibits pretty poor performance, as it's said. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and, and then you can stay encouraged and on track with your goal and make adjustments as needed. All right, so big issues I want to cover for planning for your quail, okay? Number one, you're going to need to house them. Okay, and we've done a million videos on this, like the housing and the structure, your hutch. Okay, in the resource, like mm -hmm. the Q&A has some info on the hutch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have video on here on the hutch. A million other people I'm sure have videos on YouTube about hutches. But planning your hutch properly with the ventilation being efficient, the um, predator proofing is a big issue. So make mm -hmm. sure you have the right, uh, what do you call it, wire, uh, mesh, not chicken wire. I've seen a lot of people build quail hutches with chicken wire, which is fine if it's going to be an indoor enclosure, like you're keeping in a garage. But if you have chicken wire on a quail hutch outside, they're all going to get gobbled up. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> they're minks and anything, like minks and rats, they can squeeze through anything that's the size of a quarter. And raccoons can put their hands through that size and grab your your quail. And then also raccoons and, and fox, like bigger animals, can even chew through chicken wire. Yeah, chicken wire is to keep chickens in. Maybe they should change the hardware cloth and just call it weasel wire. Because it keeps weasels <laughs> yeah, out. Right. So we use weasel wire, otherwise known <laughs> as half-inch hardware cloth, which mm -hmm. keeps your predators out. Big important thing. Uh, another recent... <clears throat> issue we had with predators on your caging is the floor remember mm -hmm. we just discussed this with that nice lady mm -hmm. so the floor of your hutch I don't get too in-depth these are some general stuff but to keep in mind the floor of your hutch right and there's a dropping pan underneath of it so you can clean it out you pull the pan out if that pan is too low and critters can scurry under there they're gonna pull the feet through the wire meshing Okay. Chew on the birds as they're laying down yeah. to sleep. On your outdoor hutch. So if you have an outdoor hutch and you have a dropping pan, you want to make sure it's pretty tight, kind of close. Not super tight up against it, but close enough where, you know, all their leavings can fall through and you can still extract that tray, but not enough room where critters can get in there. Yeah. Those are the huge issues. Some people think, well, why do I need to have a dropping pan if I have them outside? And, and you don't have to, um, but you do need to consider um, a raccoon or a fox going underneath, standing underneath your hutch and pulling your legs through. So you'll have to figure out a way to, you can use like an electric wire around the base or put wire, you know, something to prevent predators from going underneath the hutch if you don't want to try. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, building your hutch, securing your hutch area, use an old rabbit hutch. If you're building it from scratch, which is great because then you can make it exactly as you want, to house it as you want, and to fit where you want. Mm -hmm. But whatever, if you're finding something and you're repurposing it, you can do that. Just, you know, really make sure you understand the fundamentals of these quail hutches, what they need mm -hmm. for, for them to perform optimally and to be safe in there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to ramble. I mean, I could do word salad. I don't want to do that. You want to have a safe hutch. You want to have it efficient to where you can clean it out and to where the animals can access their food where it's not a problem doing food and water. So you have a water system set up mm -hmm. and a roof. Okay, and if you're outside, obviously the elements, you want to make sure they're not getting rained on. And in the winter, you might want to have some windbreak available. Just mm -hmm. like... um. We have in our hutches, I should bring in my fake hutch, but in our hutch, we have like a, um, an enclosed, partially enclosed area, sheltered area, which mainly acts as a windbreak. Mm -hmm. The entire roof is still mm -hmm. open. It's, it's hardware, hardware cloth. cloth. Yeah. So there's lots of ventilation. Which, but there's an overall, we have um, a three-tiered 
um, hutch system, yeah. and then there's an, a roof overall, you know, covering the entire thing. Three tier, meaning yeah. like three separate hutches, one on top of the other, with spacing yeah. between. Okay, and I have a video on here about that. Mm -hmm. So important, and why are we planning for the hutch? That's really a central thing. Like the quail to me are almost secondary. What's important is the housing, like the logistical stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, and I always equate them to like fish with feathers, like goldfish with feathers. They're very easy to keep. But just like with fish, you you don't buy fish and sit a bag on the counter and decide <laughs> what to do with them. Yeah. You set up the aquarium and the little space form and have everything ready as best as you can before you put the simple thing in, which is little fishies. Mm -hmm. Well, same thing here. The quail are very simple, they're very easy, but you want to have everything set up and prepped so it's not stressing you out and you're not tying loose ends and most importantly, not enjoying that experience. Because we want everybody yeah. to like you know, get their birds and be enthusiastic about them and have the kids enthusiastic about them, yeah. about the birds and they start laying. So you want to get all that primary stuff done first. Now housing leads into another issue of why we're planning properly because we want to avoid illness, okay? And that structure, mm -hmm. I'm gonna get a sip of water because I've been blabbing so much. Talk about yeah. respiratory issues with the birds and why yeah. the ventilation is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, with birds in general, um, respiratory illness would be the most common illness um, that you, you know, that it would be a potential thing that you might have. So if you have a, <clears throat> a hutch type system for your cage, then you want to make sure there's proper ventilation. Um, the quail, they actually do really well with a lot of ventilation. Chickens, um, however, that they have to be, have to be more aware um, of how much, like you don't want it to be drafty. Um, but yeah, you, you just want to make sure that they're having fresh air and... That I they mean, don't smoke. That's <laughs> yeah, them. and also if you're having like a box as well, we like to do that. We like to give them sand because it helps the quality of life. They enjoy it a lot. Um, so you they'll take sand sure, baths, like, you, yeah, like a chicken. You want to make dirt. sure that it's not um, super dusty because uh, that could create a respiratory illness. Question that you will get. Should I add diatomaceous earth? Everybody's always asking about that damn stuff. I would, I would recommend not um, because that is going to be kicked up. And it's like microscopic pieces of glass. It's just, it's not good for you to breathe in. It's not good for them to breathe in. Um, so I would recommend not. Now you can use um, like ash uh, from your, your wood, wood stove kind of thing, but you just wanna make sure you mix it with sand. So if you're using, if you wanna put that ash to good use, then you, you mix it until, mix it with sand, um, like in a bucket or something, until it doesn't look like it's creating dust as you're mixing it. Um, I would, yeah. I, so we did that, I don't like it too much, just because it, it leaves a soot. And it gets, I mean, it depends you, on you the can type use of batch. it. Yeah. Yeah. You can use it, but it'll be a little dirty, and you're, you're going to wash down your hutches anyway, um, occasionally. But yeah, the diatomaceous earth, so people use it to what? Kill the bugs, critters? Yeah, Lights. yeah, and really Which wouldn't be a problem if it's being cleaned properly. Yeah, if you keep it tidy, uh, if you scoop out manure, if you're making sure, like uh, a big thing with sand or any any kind of material that they would uh, bathe in, is some people will say, well, "Why is it getting damp? Why is it getting matted? Like like wet?" And that a big mm. usually a reason for that is because there's just moisture, there's not enough ventilation in that area. Because uh, the quail, they are pretty hot, like they run a little little hotter than like chicken. And they breathe through their mouth sometimes if they feel hot. And then in the winter time, especially if, if, it's, if it's cold outside, out in the open area of their house, and they go into their sheltered area, um, then they're, they're going to be, what do you, how do you explain that? It's the... The moisture is going into the air from them breathing, and it's just going to, like, condensation, and then that'll make your skin. Oh, yeah. yeah. These things respirate like a cuss word. Yeah, they, so. they, they breathe like a marathon runner. <laughs> yeah. They will produce a lot of um, moisture in an enclosed, unventilated um, 
cage. Yeah. If their cage yeah. is all sealed up, they'll die. So, there will just be so much moisture in there. That's why we have our, our <clears throat> the roof, the ceiling part of our of our enclosures mm -hmm. are it's, it's just a it's hardware cloth, so they have plenty of ventilation. Um, now, if that sand is getting wet like that, uh, and they're going to the bathroom in it too, now this is a potential issue for um, bacteria, organisms growing, and then you might end up with like coccidiosis or other types of illness that's not respiratory so this yeah, is important. why yeah this is why you do all this planning ahead of time because mm -hmm. you don't you don't want to run into these yeah, problems these things are preventable yeah. yeah it's disgusting you don't want to have a ton of wet crap and you know bird debris and a hutch because you didn't realize the ventilation that's necessary mm -hmm. for them and they're fine you like even in the freezing winters they're fine they'll huddle together and they're not like freezing together or huddling together <laughs> There's like any other animals in a group. They're going to pack together just to conserve mm -hmm. energy, and they have feathers, and they stay warm. And if you're in an area that's very cold, then you can you mm -hmm. can have a solid roof, or you can even do like a plastic covering that you can adjust um, open and adjust the you know how much of the ceiling you're covering with the ventilation depending on the temp temperature of the you know the night. Yeah, so if you guys, if you do quail or you have quail or maybe you're raising quail and you're watching this and you have a quail business and you see, like, oh, we always educate the customer on the housing structure. Like, give them, if you have a resource, like, you can use our resources. But if you have a resource, send them a resource on that housing structure. That'll prevent, too, if you have customers from calling you up and complaining about their birds being sick and dying because they didn't do that thing properly. But anyway, if you guys are looking to set up for spring, the reason we're blabbing about the hutch so much is because it's pretty important. That's your fish aquarium. Mm -hmm. You want to have everything set up right. The filter. Yeah, and it's easier the when there's no... Not the, um, not the quail filter. I mean the fish tank filter. When there's no animals in it yet. It's easier to make yeah. adjustments and tweak it. Yeah, and um, I guess I'm going to move on, but, you know, with the... Tr with the hutch. Just be aware of some of those things we mentioned, the predator proofing, the ventilation, mm -hmm. okay, pretty important stuff. And uh, actually one last thing about hutches is, and because somebody asked me yesterday about the hutch, how many quail can I have, which is common. There's all kinds of numbers you hear thrown out, oh, we put 37 quail per square inch and <laughs> compact them into a tight, no, 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 no. We do three to one, three three quail to one square foot. And I've heard people mm -hmm. trying to house them at five yeah, to one square yeah, foot, it, which yeah, is a I lot. Mean, if you're able, I mean, the important thing is you want the birds to be happy and healthy. healthy. Uh, you don't want them to be overly stressed by being cramped. Yeah. Um, and then also you want to avoid territorial behavior if there's way too much space. So it's a balancing act. Did you want to read Oh, Kelly, she says the wood, like we're leaning in because we're reading oh, off of a right phone. Ahead. Maybe one day I'll own a, a, a laptop. Mm -hmm. But the wood ash thing is such a great point. My shed gets so dusty from it. Mm. But gosh, they love it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it gets dusty. It gets, you like run your fingers on your gray mm. soot. Yeah. I noticed that with the quail. I mean, they like it, but I don't. So. Yeah, our quail, when we did that, they were laying their eggs in it. So then there's a fine coating on the eggshell when we were collecting them. So we, we just added more sand. Yeah. All right. Am I done with blabbing about this hutch? Because I'm always blabbing about the hutch. Because <laughs> it's important. I think I'm done. Oh, oh. <laughs> the three to one. So three, oh, yeah. we house them at th maximum three mm -hmm. quail per one square foot of mm -hmm. cage space. Okay. That's yeah. what we recommend. That's what we do. We don't go over that. Yeah. We usually run a little light anyway. Some people might have a different um, accommodations, like... There's a, there are feeders that you can mount on like the outside of feeders and waters that can be mounted on the outside of the pen and then and something like they stick their head kind of through. So there's like the whole floor space is open. Um, yeah, if you're but, taking away floor yeah. space with a feeder or watering system, yeah, that's detracting. Mm -hmm. But you know how the internet is. I say add three quail per square foot. Somebody's going to add dumb snow meat and I'm going to talk about. <laughs> They're going to give me their, well, whatever. I mean... We you do could, three per one. You can try, you know, Some different numbers based on what you see from, and I would definitely, you know, 
the when you're seeing other numbers, you're gonna want to like look into that person. Do yeah, they so are they really experienced with the quail, and you know what are their goals? What are they trying to accomplish? And, and does that match what you want to do? Yeah. And if you want really good uh, poultry information, go to the Texas A and M mm -hmm. um, website, the university. They mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. poultry specialists. Yeah. But there's lots of poultry experts online you can go to, um, and in particular for quail. Anywho, moving along. So we did caging. Ah, another thing we're planning for. So part of planning for this thing, why it's important. Uh oh, Kelly, Kelly message. Let me read it real quick. Oh my God, I wonder whose voice you were doing with that dumb son of a bitch. <laughs> I <laughs> wonder. Random, random <laughs> quail. <laughs> so anyway, I'm the dumb mm -hmm. slumbers over here. Anywho, um, so what was I yapping about just now? Oh, quail, yeah. planning with your quail. Why are we planning so early in the season? Ugh. Mm -hmm. You want to source your animals. You want to get them from reputable breeders, mm -hmm. okay? There are backlogs. People do a rush. So by the time January runs up, if mm -hmm. it's a popular breeder, bam, you're not getting anything until February or March. Yeah. Okay, they can have significant backlogs of orders. People are ordering now mm -hmm. for um, late January. I mean, late December, early January. <laughs> so, uh, huh? Yeah, you threw me off. <laughs> so, so ordering your eggs if you're going to hatch them. And there's another thing for planning. Do you have an incubator? Do you know how to operate your incubator? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you, and uh, what kind of numbers are you expecting from your hatch? And do they coincide with what you planned with the number of birds you want to keep? Going deeper into that, if you're hatching, you don't know if you're getting male or females out of your eggs. Or if they're buying day-old chicks, <laughs> unsex chicks, the same thing. Yeah, you just don't know your male to female ratio. So this goes back to your initial planning stage. You know, I, hey, I want to I wanna, I wanna grow eggs here at the house. I want to do a quail hutch because I heard they're easy to raise. And I want to have at least, I would say, you know, maybe four to six eggs equivalent to chicken eggs a day, right? Three quail eggs equal one chicken egg. And I always use the six eggs um, example. So if I want six chicken eggs a day equivalent, I want 18 quail eggs a day, which means I need 18 hens. Mm -hmm. So if I'm ordering eggs and I'm hatching them and I have no idea what's in there, it's a mixed bag, what am I getting? Let's just go with a very conservative 50-50, which sometimes doesn't happen, but we're going to assume that I'm ordering 36 eggs to get 18 hens, assuming that half are male and half are female. Now, that ratio will not be 50-50. You may be heavy male or heavy female. You don't know until they hatch. Mm -hmm. You may not have space for 36 quail, and the male quail are pretty useless just sitting there making noise all the time. So now you have the issue of turning them into sandwiches. Okay, butchering them. That Which, with that, you're going to want to consider having, you know, one or two or three extra um, cages of some sort to house grow outs. And now they are sexable at three weeks old. Very, uh, the, the jumbo quail, the jumbo browns, they're three weeks old, they're sexable. Um, but if you're growing out males because you want to wait till they're full grown at 10 weeks to weigh and select your heaviest nicest birds for your breeders you're going to want to have extra cage cages to put you know what girls. are you doing this is like starter stuff people are going oh. to get scared sorry you know, i'm just kidding that's fine yeah if you're if you're breeding even if you're new the breeding's pretty simple um and you know this is just intuition i want big birds for me so i'm going to keep the bigger birds that i have Mm -hmm. Right? To keep passing along good genes. So you have the good big bird genes. Big bird. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> back to this thing. So I don't want to get too far ahead into that. But the whole point of that illustration is to discuss that. It's a very, very simple mathematics planning stage with ordering eggs or ordering unsexed chicks um, that are going to coincide with your goal, you know, which is part of your initial planning, which is important. Because that's describing how big your hutch is going to be. That's describing how much food you're probably going to be using every month. That's describing what kind of output you should expect, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of different things. So that initial planning is, is important. I think, oh, that was from earlier. 
So um, what she's talking about, the growth, is real important. That's part of the planning because yeah. when you get, if you're hatching from eggs <clears throat> or you're getting chicks, they have to go in a super special box called a... A brooder. A brooder. Mm -hmm. A brooder box that comes from the old English. I forget what the hell it means. It's something, it has to do with chicken sitting on eggs, but <laughs> it's, yes, the brooder box. Okay. How long are they staying in a brooder after they hatch? This is part of our planning. I'm hatching eggs. Well, if you're, let's say it's wintertime, so it's cold outside, then they're going to be... You're, so, hmm, they, they have a lot of feathers by a week and a half old. Once they are two weeks old, they have, um, they're covered in, in a lot of feathers, and they really don't need much heat, if any, on them at that point, depending on where you have them. If you have them in a temperature-controlled area, the brooder, um, then by two weeks old, they won't need heat. But if you have them, like, in a barn and it's cold, then they'll need heat longer. Uh, but they'll be able to go out to the winter temperature at four weeks old. So if you have them inside for four Well, wait weeks, a minute. They can go out at the winter time at four weeks old? Yeah, they're going to be fully feathered. and then, That means total winter weather. Yes. Um, at four weeks of age. Yeah, very cold. They're um, but they also are they're more plump, so they have some insulation as well. Um, if it's fall... Don't we all? If it's fall or spring... Um, and your nighttime temperatures are, they're, they're not dropping below 40 degrees, then they can go out at three weeks old. Um, if it's not dropping below 60 degrees, then two weeks old. Um, so if it's winter time, then at two weeks old, they're going to have a lot of feathers and they're going to be pretty active. You may have to alter your type, your brooder that you have them in, um, or, they hop they, out. They get. They turn into mini helicopters. Um, and yeah, at yeah. what age do they start hopping out? Three weeks or two weeks? Oh no, one and a half weeks. They start hopping, yeah. doing their. So, they start flapping their wings. Using we wings. put a cover on top of our brooders with the little mm -hmm. chicks. Okay, and it's just a mesh cover because we don't want to suffocate them. But that's something you need to be aware of when you're planning your quail. You know where are they going? Mm -hmm. Do you have a brooder box? Which in a brooder box. It's a container, all right? Yeah, like, like a tote. A big tote, one of those Walmart totes, like you got evicted again and you got to throw everything in a box. It goes in a big tote. Yeah, that and it's very, box. very easy, you know, to use pine shavings after there are a couple, you know, like once once they're, if you're buying chicks, then um, pine shavings, do a deep deep litter system and just, just keep adding layers of pine shavings on the soiled stuff to keep it fresh. And then once you do take them out of the brooder permanently, then you can just dump it all out and clean it. Big, um, big red flag for everybody, too, because we're here on the book. or No, we're on the tube doing a talk. Mm. One of the best or one of the uh, worst things of the Facebook and the Craigslist is there's a million dimwit scammers. Mm. All right? They're either selling you nothing and just getting money or they're selling you very poor quality mm. creatures. Hey, I've got a whole bunch of birds. They're really great birds. And they, like they're all disheveled looking monstrosities. But you feel bad because they're $10 and you take them home. You're like, what am I going to do with these things? Mm -hmm. So that's called the vetting process. Make sure whoever you're getting your critters from, they're competent at least to some degree and know what they're doing with their birds. So they're selling you quality animals. You want to start out with good stuff, okay? You don't have to spend a fortune. They're not that expensive, especially compared to chickens, mm -hmm. okay? But, you know, get something of quality and get some recommendations if you don't know anybody and uh, you'll find them. Like there's groups online and you can find stuff. You can find like decent breeders. You just got to do the work. You just don't want to get tricked because you saw a picture online and somebody said the word quail and you're getting anxious to raise quail and you buy the first thing you see. You may not be getting very good birds, or you may not be getting and, anything. And what he means by quality is that it, the health of the bird, the quality um, in the breeding will affect how well they're laying. If they're laying <clears throat> consistently, they're good layers, they're nice big eggs, they're, they're vibrant and um, just, you know, not prone to illness. Like if you're buying from a breeder who isn't, uh, aware or care, they don't care about the health of their birds, and they might be breeding 
like illness into their birds and and weak you know respiratory like weak immune systems and such so you want to make sure they're they're the quality does matter if you want a good product with anything. Yeah, do you want 300 eggs per hen per year or 200 or 160? Yeah. Some low number. Or do you want nice it's just big an birds? Example. Yeah. Yeah. And a, and a good temperament, friendly birds. Yeah, and then, you know, maybe you want to sell the things at some point. You don't want to have deformed-looking animals or mm -hmm. subpar creatures yourself. Mm -hmm. And people, they're popular. You know, if you want to sell them, I'm sure you can, if you breed them. Especially, I always encourage the kids, you know, when they do this, like families with young kids. It's very rewarding for them because they are participating in something that's producing food for the family. And there's a tangible output. You know, there's A's or something they can pick up and see. And they're really proud of what they did. Even the big kids, the full-grown adult ones, you know, we're very happy when... You produce a vegetable mm -hmm. or you produce something and here you're producing eggs and especially you guys who have no experience and don't really know anything about farm animals or anything like that this is something that's going to be rewarding because it's really simple and yeah. they do they do lay a lot of eggs and you will be yeah. eating, and they're healthy and know? they're they're generally quiet animals um if you have the proper ratio male to female then they're quiet so it's it's just overall like a positive good experience the quail are because there's not like suddenly this, you know, the chicken roosters are super loud and the God, hens. Those things all morning. Ah, 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 ah. All morning. Then the hens, they lay their, they have their egg song and depending on the breed and the size, it could be really loud. And sometimes all of the hens start, you know, singing with her in the quail. They don't do that. They're really quiet. And then they're, you know, you're getting eggs from them quickly. They're easy to care for. They don't need a ton of space. You can have them close to your house. Your neighbors might not even know you have them. So... Yeah. Or they may hear this strange sound they're not familiar with, that yeah. crickety sound. Kicker, 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 the little bird noise. Anyhow, mm -hmm. yeah. so planning with that. And that's actually, you bring up a good point. Um, depending on where you live, planning in your zone. Like, we have people who do keep them in urban environments, like the city, you know. Mm -hmm. And they still keep them there. But like she said, they're quiet. Mm -hmm. So um, they don't cause a ruckus or people aren't going nuts about them. But, you know, plan for your zone. And it, they're usually not, oh, hold on, they're usually not, they're not regulated, but that's not legal advice. So <laughs> I, I would say that most of the time not regulated, um, but check your local zoning or whatever, especially mm -hmm. if you're a little itchy about it. And if you are in a city area, don't, um, <laughs> don't underestimate predators. A lot of people who are in the city or some people in the city, they don't realize that there's actually a lot of nocturnal predators that come out at night. Um, the raccoons, the foxes, the rats, the cats, um, you know, there's still a, a lot of them in, in the city yeah. type areas. Cause it, wherever there's a lot of people, there's a lot of garbage <laughs> and there's a lot of easy food to get. So make, don't be lazy about predator proofing. Your yeah. Yeah. Kelly said he's, I'm super urban. My neighbors hate them. Oh, no. Oh, no. I don't care if it's legal here because it's always lawful. That's correct. Well, mm -hmm. I, I agree with that. Yeah. But I just say that because people get, we have people who are paranoid. I had one guy who mm -hmm. was afraid to do anything in his own garage. Yeah. I was like, okay. Well, whatever. <laughs> don't do it then. Like, yeah. You don't have to be like, I mean, mm -hmm. ugh. Literally, you drive down any street and people are just selling drugs left and right. And you're going to get yelled at for raising five little birds? Give me a break. But that's the world you live in. Moving on. So, we talked about enclosures. Talked about sicknesses, disease. And do we discuss injury? I don't think we need to. Injury is injury. That happens. Actually, I'll move it into that because that's something to discuss. Um, but, 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 but. Anything else pertinent to pre-planning? Because this is really what I wanted to discuss about yeah. pre-planning. You just like just Christopher said, you want to figure out how many eggs you want to you want to get in a week, based on your familiarity with chicken eggs, so that you're figuring out the amount of birds that you want. And um, if you're getting chicks, then we definitely recommend uh, getting uh, extra chicks or even doubling the number that you want to end up with to compensate for the possibility of getting males in the bunch. If you really want to get a certain amount of females, then you definitely want to get extra chicks, unsexed chicks, um, if you're getting the young ones. 
that way you can end up starting at a good number because then there'll be people they'll just get like 10 and then they end up like maybe five females and they really wanted you know all of them to be female <laughs> but then it's a, if if you start at a small number and you, but you wanted to have go get going with a larger number then it can take time to make that adjustment get more than necessary yeah. and the reason i say that remember we had people we had people who would order 10 and then they got like two and then they come back and order more and then yeah it was a really long process driving for them back to get and forth. to the number they ended up they really wanted to be at from the start so and i'm like what are these people doing why don't they just like <laughs> come on because i feel bad right mm -hmm. i feel bad that somebody is wasting their time trying to like hopefully getting exactly what they want mm -hmm. on a random draw yeah. of a potential 50-50 give or take in one direction or the other because of the male to female ratio right from these straight run chicks you know, like you know the benefit of the straight run chicks by the way they're cheap they're cheaper mm -hmm. you're not paying for an older you're paying when you buy an older sexy animal you're not just paying for the fact that you know they're male or female, but the people housing them, Raising taking them, care of them, them, you know, it's the labor, intensive labor to get them yeah. to that age, too, that you're paying for. Because now they're three weeks old as opposed to three days old. But I always encourage people, like, when, don't be intimidated about the idea of getting a bunch of extra males um, yeah. with chicks. Because... If you're going to want to reproduce your birds, whether it's for eggs or meat, then you're going to want to select birds for breeding. Your, your main group is your breeding group. So when you, um, you're picking birds, then you're going to, you want to pick the biggest, as long as they're you know, 16 ounces or under, um, the biggest, the most healthy looking that represents the breed. And if you have a selection then you can pick the best from what you have. But if you only have two males and you need two males, then like you got to get, you got to go with what you got. But if you have, you know, six uh, to pick from, then you can really, you know, start your, your, your breeding group at a good place. Yes. So. That's exactly correct. I was about to say something else. I'll lose my train of thoughts. ADHD is driving me damn nuts. I can't pay attention to five things. Okay. I think that... About suffices. I had one other thing that was kind of injury. important. Well, no. Oh, thank God. It was about food. Important. Okay, food. You're feeding. Where are you sourcing feed? Mm. Okay, you're feeding these creatures. They kind of do like to eat. So you got to replace the food. Where are you getting it? Now, a common place for starter router people is the giant tractor shop. Sure, you can get food there. Now, we don't get food we get some there but we don't get our general food from the giant tractor store we go to a feed mill it's much much cheaper mm -hmm. okay so uh, you may want to investigate feed mills local feed mills in your area the food is cheaper it's fresher because it's mm -hmm. coming from a local source oh and then if you're hippy dippy you can say it's locally sourced yeah and so it is and they're making the all feed, our stuff from around here so it's it's like he said it's fresher it's the more nutrition there if you're getting it from a big box store the feed is likely going to be like like months and months old like six eight months old like it they're in it's in the bags and the yeah. whole process takes a long time to get to the customer if you're going to a mill um they're mixing it themselves yeah the mill so makes fresh. it so they're getting it from the farmers yeah, yeah you know like any other commodity they don't trust from the field prep it and get it to you immediately from the field and then it's going to be in a transition state and at that time like she said it's not fresh and what she means by not fresh isn't like we think of it not fresh it doesn't taste good it means that the nutrients have begun to oxidize and they're breaking down so the nutrient components of the whole food which is now cracked open mm -hmm. and exposed to huge surface area to the oxygen Oxygen is very, very corrosive. Any chemistry people out there? So the oxygen is starting to destroy these delicate fats and whatnot and the uh, vitamins in the food. And then the pelleted or crumble, the way they <laughs> do that. They heat it they, up. They heat it up, which that is going to compromise the food and break down. the. It's oxidizing. It's, it's the nutrition is going to degrade faster. And why this is important is because nutrition 
like any living creature, even humans, the nutrition you're taking in, your body needs their 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 body needs a certain level of nutrition daily to function. And if they're laying eggs or living, <laughs> then they need um, that energy to produce their eggs. If the food is lacking in nutrition or it's it's just it's old, you know, then it could affect their productivity or just longevity. Um, I mean, their whole every the whole function of the body. Yeah, way deep inside. I don't know if we know way deep inside by first name. We may do. I don't know. But if we don't, hi, I'm Chris. Anyway, <laughs> you were saying I supplement feed by picking specific broadleaf weeds in my yard. Oh, okay. awesome. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, man, you got like what do you call it? The um, how am I forgetting this? Oh, God, the the wild spinach, the asparagus stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The weeds are exceptionally nutritious. And, you know, a uh, little tangent about feed. I should have a, a beard and a hat because I feel like an old-time hippie with this speech. But when you take food out of a bag and you're feeding it to an animal, that is artificial. You're supplementing their, um, their evolutionary diet, right? So we're trying to supplement the needs of the animal by... Oh, Hi, Steve. Oh, hi. Nice to meet you. Mm -hmm. I don't know if our buddy's on the Facebook. and come visit us over there, too. We do a lot of stuff there. But, um, yeah, the food we're pulling out of bags, it's a supplemental of what they would be getting naturally out in the wild. And it's never going to compare to that natural diet where they're scrounging around mm -hmm. and eating a huge Fine, variety yeah. of... Because they're working all day looking for bugs and plants. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to provide optimally the amount of nutrition the animal would require in this very, very controlled um, package. Mm, domesticated and, setting. You know, this animal feed. Mm -hmm. So you want to do a little bit of research about the feed. We, um, oh, oh, thanks, man. Yeah. Oh, okay. And Steve, if you have any questions about anything, I don't know where you are with all of this kind of stuff, but, you know, Feel free to send us questions. I like educating people. I blab a lot, but I usually, I'll write to you. Um, yeah, so the diet of the animal, you want to have it as healthy as possible. And you want to source the food, uh, you know, know the food that you're getting, that you're giving to your creatures. I mean, you know, think about like dog food, okay? You can buy cheap kibble, little brown circles. It'll keep the animal alive and they'll get calories from it, but... You know, if there's a human equivalent, would you want to eat that, or would you want you know, when you think about fresh vegetables us, and whatnot? If we're eating sugary, you know, pastries and foods that don't give us the proper nutrition, then we're gonna feel lethargic. We're gonna feel like not motivated, brain fog. Um, we're, we're not gonna be productive. Our bodies are going to if we keep doing that, keep eating that, keep eating that day after day, then we're gonna have like physical changes in our organs and um that are detrimental to our health and like our arteries and how our hearts function but if we're eating healthy if we're eating what our bodies need daily then we're going to have energy we're going to be productive um, mentally emotionally physically um it completely is you know very different when you have proper nutrition <laughs> and the last thing i want is a quail with brain fog <laughs> Sitting there, not laying Sitting in there, it. Not feeling... <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. Yeah, proper nutrition for the animal. Do a little research. That's a big component of the pre-planning because you want to save money, but you want to have healthy animals. And if you guys are looking to sell the creatures, you definitely want to have healthy stock, which is, uh, the food's going to be critical. You want to have quality food for them. All right? Shall do that. Thank you very much. Oh, right on, Steve. Thanks, man. I think that I'm sweating to death. <laughs> so I'm either going to have a heart attack or I've just been talking too much. Uh, I think you're okay. All right. She doesn't know this, but you guys know. Uh, what's her name? Elizabeth, I'm coming to join you, honey. <laughs> she doesn't know Sanford and Son. Greatest TV mm -hmm. show ever made. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I think that does it. This was kind of like an open... We do a lot of these open Q&A forum kind of things, uh, but uh, planning for spring, this is kind of time to do it, all right? Because it's, and financially too, for a lot of people, it's the end of their fiscal season, you know, mm -hmm. New Year's starting up. So they can look yeah. at like what their expenditures were, can they implement new this or that, 
you know, what kind of costs are they looking at? So this is also a good time for planning during that time. Yeah, Fred Sanford, that's right, man. One of my favorite shows. You had me watch a couple episodes. Great show. <laughs> that's why I failed most of my uh, elementary school slash high school years. After school, I'd watch that show instead of doing work. Anyhow. <clears throat> Yeah, so plan planning is important. That's why we want to do this. Hopefully, we can we help you guys out, or at least motivate somebody, especially new people. Don't be afraid. You know, just dive in. Worst that could happen is you're going to learn something. And I guess that that'll be that. Do you have anything else to say, nice wife? Um, no, just really important. We like to always point out, as we have, um, to to make your goals, set your goals, and then. Uh, you have your big goal, your main objective, and then work backwards and set your steps and to get to that goal that are obtainable. And then as you're working towards these smaller steps, adjust, make adjustments as needed so that you yeah. are encouraged and you continue with momentum. And if you have a problem, don't go psychotic. Just give us a call or call somebody who knows what they're doing. Write an email and get the help you need. There's plenty of resources out there. Yeah. Or check on the old tube. The YouTube, uh, speaking of which, at the bottom again, you guys, these little PDFs, I have a couple links, bit.ly links. This thing, we give it out to everybody. It's been pretty helpful. Mm -hmm. Like people read these things and mm -hmm. it's pretty simple format with yeah. very direct, easy stuff to understand. So this will not be scary. <laughs> I guess that'll be that. And next week is Thanksgiving. So happy early Thanksgiving. I, I think we'll skip Thursday. Maybe we'll do Wednesday or Friday. Or we might not <laughs> do it next week. I could just do a personal one just for me. Mm. All right, friends. We'll see you. Have a good Thank night. Thank you for stopping by. Bye.